Yeah, all right. Good evening. Good evening, all, and happy Sabbath. It is great to be back for our last family focus Vespers. Uh, good, good. I thought I, I, I wanted to hear that R uh, from you, and I didn't want to ask for it, but he gave it to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Samuel Samakula. Uh, this is my phone number at the top. Remember, I told you last time it's not for you to call me, it's for you to send through your questions. So when the pastor comes up and he does his presentation, if you've got any questions you have, please, that's the number. You can send any message for the pastor, not for me, for the pastor to answer. Uh, we'll also have an open mic at the front here. So if you're confident enough to come forward and ask your question directly, that option is there as well. I would just like to open up with a word of prayer before we continue. If we can all stand, if we can all stand. You're going to do a lot of sitting, so we can stand for a little bit. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for gathering us here together safely and well. We thank you for bringing us through another week. Some have had good weeks. Some have had difficult weeks. Some have had uh, strange and lovely weeks. But, oh God, whatever kind of week we may have had, we thank you we've made it through. And we ask you even now for your Holy Spirit to continue to abide with us, to lead us, and to have your name glorified in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name we prayed. Amen. 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 Uh, we have Pastor Aki again with us. Um, he was with us, I believe, two weeks ago. And he's come back again to finish off the program for us. Um, he's been re-elected again as the BUC Family Ministry Director. So we praise God for that. He's going to be able to continue what he has started within that department. I pray you continue to pray for him. He's a married man. Um, he's been in ministry for, I believe, 26 years or so. Um, and God has continued to bless him. And by God's grace, he will lead him today as he has been for the past few years. So I would like to introduce or to call up the choristers or the choir or the singers to lead us into the next session. And after the music, we will have... Uh, past the accurate presentation. But please remember, send your questions through. Also online, we'd like to welcome you guys. Please, you can have the number or you can put your questions in the chat. If you can put your questions in the chat, YouTube, Facebook, um, we'd love to hear your questions so they can be answered at the front here. Thank you very much, guys. Happy service, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Oh, it's so nice to have a Sabbath, isn't it? Like, week passed so quickly, and then actually college have a mid-semester break, and then we are thinking, okay, we will make a productive week, we will do study, and, you know, like, but it's gone. <laughs> but at least we have a Sabbath. We can have a peace and rest and breathe. Let's stand and sing in Christ alone, and yeah, this is a very well-known song, but lyrics is so powerful. Let's sing it. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. My comforter, my all in all, he is the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who to confess, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. Talk by the arms he came to save. Till on the cross as Jesus died, the grace of God was justified. For every sin on him was laid. He in the death of Christ I live. Day in the grass. 
take me home here in the power of Christ I stand no power of hell no skin of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns to take me home here in the power of Christ I stand Thank you very much. Um, good to be with you once again. I look forward to spending this uh, weekend with you. Um, we are looking at, oh, once we get our slides up, give them a moment. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are looking at a topic of change your mind, promoting personal and relational health with CBT. The reason I've chosen this topic is that we are seeing a trend in society. And that trend is an increase in young people experiencing mental health issues. Now, for, for those who experience anxiety, depression, who enter into the um, clinical uh, system, uh, clinical intervention, uh, one of the, the, the most effective forms of intervention is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Now, CBT is essentially um, an intervention which helps people to identify negative patterns of thinking and then to, to break the, those negative cycles. So what we think leads into our behavior and what we uh, what we do, how we act, feeds into our, our emotions, the way we feel, and our emotions then feed back into our thoughts, and that occurs in the cycle. Now, that's great if the way that we think and the way that we, we operate is positive. But if we are troubled with negative patterns of thinking, then it simply becomes reinforced uh, through the way that we operate. Now, Paul says this in Romans 12 and verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what Paul is saying here, we need a transformation in our minds. And that transformation in our minds is not just about uh, gaining a new capacity to understand and appreciate who God is. It also involves changing the way we think. And changing the way we think from a, new, from a neurobiological perspective is about rewiring our brains. Now we are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible tells us. Listen to this from Ellen White. She says, man came from the hand of God perfect in organization and beautiful in form. All his faculties of mind and body were fully developed and harmoniously balanced. Again, she says, he who created the mind and ordained its laws provided for its development in accordance with them. So the mind is, is designed to operate in particular ways. And if, they, if it doesn't operate according to the laws God has put in place, then we experience dysfunction, we experience um, uh, poor mental health, uh, and, and a host of, of other negative experiences. So it's important for us to understand how the mind works so that we can utilize the laws of God in a most effective way. So our early experiences influence our patterns of thinking, feeling, and behavior, and they become our default ways of thinking. What we learn in our early formative years tends to stay with us throughout our lifetime. Uh, George Barner, who has done some extensive research in, in, in the way we develop 
spirituality. He's done uh, extensive research in what makes uh, healthy relationships, healthy families, and also healthy churches. And uh, in his research, what he has discovered is that our worldview, the way we see the world, is developed between the ages of 0 to 14. By the time we reach about the age of 14, we have the worldview that we will probably die with. So we have a relatively narrow window of opportunity to uh, secure and to, to uh, nail down our worldview, to develop a, a Christian worldview. Uh, Solomon said this, Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way that he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, while Solomon did not study interpersonal neurobiology, um, he did understand that what we learn in those early formative years uh, can influence us throughout our lifetime. Now, in the field of, of neurobiology, there is a concept known as Hebb's Law. And Hebb's law says that neurons that fire together wire together so that repeated thoughts create neural pathways that make it easier for us to repeat those thoughts. And again, that's the way God has designed our minds to work. His desire is that we would internalize healthy values and that we would act on those healthy values. And the more we act on those healthy values, the more we will grow to become like him. But because of the entrance of sin into the world, that system was uh, disrupted so that the negative ways of thinking also operate in this particular way. So those negative ways of thinking um, from the standpoint of, of psychology and CBT result in what's known as cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are falsehoods we believe about ourselves and or others based on faulty core beliefs. And the main ones that CBT focuses on, uh, you can see them up there, I won't go through all of them, but all or nothing thinking, uh, minim minimizing, catastrophizing, and these can become our default ways of operation. So we need to learn how to not only become aware of how we are thinking, but also to begin breaking those negative cycles of thinking. So our lives will always move in the direction of our strongest thoughts, positively or negatively. So it's vitally important for us to become aware of what we are thinking. You know, we tend to believe that we are... We are rational beings and that we are always making rational decisions. The reality is that most of the decisions we make are the unconscious repetition of what we have done in the past. So vitally important that we, we, we become aware of not only what we are thinking, but why we are thinking. Now we've all seen um, images of, of, of elephants who are tethered by you know, small ropes and a little metal peg. And the question is, how does that come to be? These large creatures that are able to uproot trees out of the ground, and yet they are able to be tethered with these small ropes and these tiny little pegs. Well, how does that happen? When the elephant is young, it is chained with a large chain and it will struggle as much as it can to try and free itself from its tether, but it gets to a point where it realizes it cannot free itself from the, the, that, that chain. And so in its mind, it becomes an impossibility. So no matter how large that elephant grows, once it's tethered by its ankle to, 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 to the ground or whatever, it believes it cannot break free. Now, this is a principle that operates not only in the minds of elephants, but also in the minds of human beings. Lies believed as truth will affect our lives as if they were true. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with the, with the story of, of uh, Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, where you've got the main character, Othello, who, who comes to believe 
because he's been lied to by somebody who pretends to be his best friend, he comes to believe that his wife Desdemona is having an affair. And that belief influences the way he operates to the point that he kills his wife Desdemona because he believed the lie about her. The Bible says, Proverbs 14, verse 12, there is a way that appears right, but the end, but in the end it leads to death. There is a way that seems right, it feels right, but it's a falsehood, and it leads to death. Listen to this from Review and Herald, uh, January 5, 1886. Ellen White says this about Adam and Eve. Eve believed the words of Satan, and the belief of that falsehood in regard to God's character changed the condition and character of both herself and her husband. So God didn't change. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what changed was their characters. Why? Because they believed a lie. Now, how does this operate in the realm of neurobiology? Um, in our brains, there is an area called the, the limbic system. And within the limbic system, there is something called the amygdala. The amygdala is the emotional control center of the brain. And within the amygdala, there's an area called the reticular activating system. Now, the reticular activating system has various different functions, but one of the functions it has is that it operates as a filter. What the reticular activating system is designed to do is to keep us thinking what we think and keep us doing what we do. Now, that's all well and good, again, when we are operating in a healthy way, when we have good values and we are acting in, 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 uh, in, in ways that God wants us to operate. But if we are operating in negative ways, if we have these cognitive distortions, if we believe, for example, that, that, uh, that we are no good, we'll never amount to anything, if you have low self-esteem, then no matter what happens around you, it becomes very difficult to break that way of thinking. So you might do something that is praiseworthy, and somebody might say to you, good job, you know, excellent, you know, you really did well there. But because your mind is stuck on this negative cycle of, of I am worthless, I will never amount to anything, you might say something like, oh, it's just a fluke. Because your mind will not allow you to believe something that's different from what it has been programmed to believe for maybe years and years and years and years and years. So we need to become aware of what we are thinking, why we are thinking it, and then put into operation uh, ways of thinking that will break the negative cycles. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says this, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So, so Paul is saying here, listen, every thought that goes through our minds, we need to take control of our thoughts. And he's also saying that we, that we need to break strongholds. Strongholds, the idea behind it is it's like a, like a fortress. But, but, the, but the, the language that Paul uses here is that we need to demolish these strongholds. And, and to demolish, the Greek word indicates to destroy with power, to lower with violence. Now, the reality is that many of the strongholds that, that we are held captive by, we do not have the power in our own strength to break them. But God makes power that available to us that enables us to break those strongholds. Now, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there was a belief um, in, in the field of, of neurobiology that if you lose brain cells, 
that's it, they're gone, finished, and you can't do anything about it. The brain did not have the capacity to regenerate new cells. But what has been discovered uh, in the last 20, 30 years is the concept of neuroplasticity. That is, the brain has the power to be able to generate new cells. Now, the upshot of that is that negative patterns of thinking can be reprogrammed through the exercise of the prefrontal cortex. Now, what tends to happen in the way that we make our decisions is that we operate largely on the basis of our emotions. You know, if you think of babies, babies are very emotional beings. When a baby is hungry, it cries. When, it, when it's uh, uncomfortable, it cries. Babies don't think to themselves, it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna let my mom sleep. So, they don't think that way. They're, they operate purely on the basis of their emotions. But as a baby grows, if it grows in a healthy way, it learns more, and they become a, a young child and they grow into the, the, the teenage years. The idea is that they will cease to operate purely on the basis of emotions and, and, and eventually be operating on the basis of rationality. Um, Paul says, you know, well, when I was a child, I thought as a child, but now I put away childish things. And, and the putting it away of childish things is operating purely on the basis of emotions. God wants us to operate on the basis of rationality, on the basis of um, a, a healthy functioning conscience, which gives us the capacity to decide between right and wrong, and operating those in the context of our relationship with him, our worship relationship with him. So, in order to break strongholds, we need to learn how to stop relying on our emotions and use those emotions to submit the information we get from our emotions to the higher power of the brain so that we can make good spiritual judgments. So, what can we do to turn on positive neuroplasticity? Well, there are many things that we can do. I'll just share a few of them with you. Get a decent night's sleep. Now, how many of you consider yourselves to get the right amount of sleep that you need? Let me see a quick straw poll. Okay. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's about the average. Most of us don't get as much sleep um, as we need. So, if you're not getting a decent night's sleep, on a regular basis, that's something you need to give focused attention on as to what you can do to change um, that pattern because that impairs the, the effective functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Exercise, uh, getting sunlight, especially now that the, you know, the, the darkness is, is, is uh, the winter darkness is, is setting in, we need to utilize the sunlight as much as possible. Um, reading, memorizing scripture, um, Intermittent fasting has been found to be a very effective way of, of promoting neuroplasticity. Um, hard work, uh, learning new skills. It's just a few, few, uh, last year I decided to start learning how to juggle, and it's a brilliant way to, to relax. Um, musical, what, listening to music, but also learning a musical instrument. All these things can help to promote uh, positive neuroplasticity develop good habits. So, Ellen White says this, everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to me, it is mine to exercise. So it's all about how we use our power of choice. So one of the ways that we can um, break negative cycles is through the concept of cognitive reframing. Cognitive reframing involves learning to identify and correct irrational thinking. So again, this is about paying attention to what is going on in our minds, submitting it to truth, and seeing whether or not it stands the test. Um, Paul says this, Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. For to me, for to me to live is Christ and to die 
is gain. And this is an amazing statement for Paul to make, because Paul is a guy who has gone through all kinds of trouble. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists them, all the things, shipwrecks, beatings, all, you name it. He's gone through it, and yet he is able to look at what happened to him through a large frame, a big picture, and be able to say that, look, what I've gone through, it will turn out for my deliverance. God's going to use it for a positive purpose. And what he is doing here, he is reframing. He's looking at a, a negative circumstance, and he's seeing the positive that's coming out of it. Um, there's a saying that one man looks out from prison bars, sorry, two men looks out from prison bars, one saw mud, the other stars. It's about perspective. I remember when I was listening to um, a sermon by, by C.D. Brooks, and he was talking about David uh, when he went out into to take food to his brothers. And he saw the Israelites there, and Goliath is doing his thing in the field, and the Israelites are quaking in their boots. And, and the Israelites take one look at Goliath, and they say, look at the size of him. We will never defeat him. David takes one look at Goliath and says, look at the size of him. I can't miss. Same circumstance, different perspective. And so that requires some intentionality on our part. As well as reframing our circumstances, we can also pre-frame. And that is to choose ahead of time how we will React. If you think of the three Hebrews in, in the fire and their, their encounter uh, um, with, with the king, they say to him, look, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, but if not, so their minds are open to the possibility that God is not going to deliver them, but they have this made, a, they made up their minds that whatever happens, we're not going to bow down. So they've decided ahead of time, they have pre-framed what they are going to do in the circumstance that they are facing. And that's, some, again, something that we need to, to practice, um, to look ahead, look at what we're going to face, and decide that however things turn out, this is the course I'm going to choose. And that's about operating on the basis of our values and our standards rather than reacting based on our emotions. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. What she's saying here is that you will find what you look for. You know, vultures find dead, rotting flesh because that's what they look for. Um, hummingbirds find nectar because that's what they look for. We will find what we focus our attention on. So the principles of CBT are consistent with what the Bible tells us. Philippians 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of such things. There are your thoughts. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. That's your behavior. And the God of peace will be with you. That's the emotion that will flow. And so the idea of thoughts leading into behavior, leading into emotions, and that cycle is right there in the scriptures. Aristotle said we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So we need to learn good habits, good spiritual habits, good habits of health, good habits of, of thinking. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it uh, with your might. So if we want to improve, if we want to be excellent, if we want to be proficient in anything, it doesn't happen by, it's never going to happen by accident. 
It requires effort, it requires time, it requires energy and investment. So we need to harness the power of our minds, and rewiring our brains are a function of attention. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we paying attention to? It is a law of the human mind that by beholding, we become changed. So what we focus our attention on will shape who we are, how we think, and how we behave. Wrong habits are not overcome by a single effort. Only through long and severe struggles is self-mastered. This is reality. I'm not saying this to scare you, but this is the bottom line. You know, if you are here as students, or you have been here as students, you will know this. You know, you don't, you don't learn Greek by accident. You've got to spend time with it. If you don't pay it adequate attention, you will pay the price. You don't learn how to play a musical instrument by accident. It requires hours and hours of, of effort. You don't become proficient in, in, in finance by accident. It all takes effort. Muhammad Ali said this once. He said, I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Suffer now and spend the rest of your life as a champion. So if we want to be, if we want to, to, to strive for excellence, it's going to require effort and self-mastery. In order for truth to set us free, the Bible says, and Jesus says in John 8, you know, the truth shall set you free. But in order for the truth to set you free, we have to internalize it needs to live inside us so it becomes our automatic response. The psalmist said, Behold, said of God, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. So we have to internalize truth. So how do we do that? Well, study the word. We hide God's word in our hearts, and, and as we hide God's word in our hearts, as we spend time focusing attention on his word, it begins to create new neural pathways. You know, I said about the, one of the things that we can do to promote neuroplasticity. I mean, Ellen White says in one place that the best thing that we can do to improve the mind is the study of God's word. So as we hide God's word in our hearts, it will transform us. As we behold, we become changed. So start your day in God's word, and that sets the trend for fortifying your mind with his truth. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. So again, that's about capturing your thought. What am I thinking? And if you realize that what you're thinking is negativity, then begin that process of reframing. Tell yourself um, how you want to be and how you want to operate. So taking our thoughts captive means that we are intentional about our internal conversation. How many of you talk to yourself? <laughs> now, every hand should have gone up. Now, not, some of us do it audibly. All of us do it internally. We all have this internal conversation that is going on. You need to listen to that conversation. Take it captive and then begin to talk to yourself. Um, determining declarations. So making personal declarations is an effective way of disputing the lies we are tempted to believe. Now, personal declarations. I want to be clear about this. This is nothing to do with um, mantras, you know, and, and, and trying to convince yourself to believe something that is not true. Uh, making personal declarations is simply reinforcing truth in your mind. So, for example, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you are confronted by a situation 
where you, you are tempted to doubt your ability to, to be able to succeed or get through, you can speak to yourself. You, say, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this talking to ourselves helps to reinforce God's truth in our minds. Uh, Jesus, when he was in the, the wilderness of temptation, every time the enemy tempted him, what did he do? He quoted scripture. Now, Jesus' quoting of scripture was a natural response to temptation because he had already internalized the word. Um, Morris Fenden, who was an Adventist pastor back in the day when I first came into the church, prolific writer, he said this. He said, if you don't have the money in the bank, don't write the check. Do the spiritual work beforehand so that when the crisis comes, you have a spiritual resource uh, from which to draw. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we put God's word in our hearts so that when we are challenged, that's what comes out. Christian meditation is another way of rewiring our brains. And, and the difference between Christian meditation and, and Eastern meditation is that on Eastern meditation, that's about emptying our minds. Christian meditation is about focused attention on God and the things of God. So it is biblically focused for the purpose of seeking after God, requires a full in, emotional engagement commits God's word to memory, fosters continual connection with God, applies what is learned to practical experience, involved focused reflection on what God reveals, stimulates expression, is an avenue for God to instruct, and it leads to joy through deep intimacy. And all of these principles you can find in, in Joshua chapter 1 and Psalm 119. So Christian meditation is about focused attention on God and the things of God. Uh, Ellen White says, Christians should cultivate a love for meditation and cherish a spirit of devotion. To discipline the mind to dwell upon heavenly things will put life and earnestness into uh, all of our endeavors. Now, notice what she says, discipline the mind. It again requires intentionality and it requires effort. Psalmist says, I will meditate on your precepts and, and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Another way that we can rewire the brain, through the power of prayer. It is said that prayer is not the preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. And we know that prayer works, don't we? How do we know that prayer works? We see the results, but what are the results? See, what is the primary purpose of prayer? The primary purpose of prayer is communication. The primary purpose of prayer is connection. So that if we get the things we want or we don't get the things we want, we still maintain the connection. So faith is the victory. So we know that prayer works not necessarily because we see things happening. We know that, prepare, that prayer works because of the change that it brings about in our character, in our relationship with God. In this book, How God Changes Your Brain, it's written by Andrew, I can't even read that. But anyway, he is um, Newberg. That's, yeah. um, he's not a Christian, but yet he's written this book because he, he studied um, how faith impacts the brain. And he came to this conclusion that praising and worshiping God leads to quantifiable changes in a part of the brain called the cingulate cortex, which results in increased capacity for compassionate thinking and feeling. So even those who do not believe in God can see how the worship of God, those who believe, 
actually rewires the brain and gives us a capacity, not only for personal growth, but also um, our ability to be able to relate to others. Then there's praise. Um, Praise fixes our thoughts on God for who he is, regardless of what he may or may not be doing. When we praise him, he turns up. Now, praise, again, is one of those things that we need to to, uh, exercise intentionality in doing. I I spent some time with uh, the Cornerstone counselors, did a weekend for them, and we, we did an exercise where I asked them to, for one minute, Praise. Don't ask God for anything. Don't thank him for anything. Just one minute of praise. Now, after the minute, I ask you, well, how did you find that? And, um, and they say, yo, that was, mm, that was not so easy. You know, one minute doesn't sound like a long time, but just praising, nothing but praising, that's, that's not so easy. But there was one, one, one of the counselors said, oh, that, that, I found that was easy, Pastor. And I said, well, how come you found that so easy? And she said, well, when, when I was growing up as a child, in our village, every once in a while, the king of the region used to come to visit. And, and our parents and our teachers used to teach us to prepare for the visit of the king so that when the king came, we would lavish praise on him. Oh, you are wonderful, you are mighty, you are strong, you are generous. And so she said when it came to to learning how to praise God, it was easy because we'd already learned how to praise the king. So praise is something we need to be intentional about because sometimes we think, you know, well, well, we praise God when things are going great, praise will come naturally. But we need to learn how to praise God when things are not going so well. I remember we were having an evangelistic um, campaign in, in East London back in the day, and we, a problem arose, and I phoned up the, uh, my, my senior pastor, and I said, Pastor, we have a problem. The first thing he said was, praise God. Because he had practiced his mind to give God praise in all circumstances. Psalmist says, I will bless the Lord, all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Now, we know that the the experience of the psalmist, not everything was going well all the time, but he made a decision that he would praise God at all times. So cultivate the spirit of praise. Nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings. And I think she finishes off by as much as it is to, uh, a duty to pray. Albert Schweitzer, have an attitude of gratitude. How grateful are you? Albert Schweitzer said this, the greatest thing is to give thanks for everything, for who has, for he who has learned this knows what it means to live. So gratitude is a practice that we need to do on a daily basis. And no matter what we are going through, we can always find something to give God thanks for. Let me leave you with this. Choose joy. Uh, the Bible says, the psalmist says that in God's presence there is fullness of joy. So choosing joy is to choose to to live in his presence. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Thank you very much, Pastor. I hope everybody enjoyed that and you learned something. I definitely did. There was a few questions that came through. The first question was, I have believed like the elephant I cannot break free from negative thoughts. I see that now. What steps can I take to be free if my brain is used to it? 
Yeah, um, expose yourself to truth and expose yourself to truth on a regular basis. Um, depending on what the, the, the captivity or the bondage is, that might require some outside intervention. Um, I am a great advocate of, of counseling. I've had counseling myself on, on numerous occasions. Um, if there is something that we are struggling with that we do not have the capacity to deal with ourselves, then get help. And if my washing machine breaks down, I don't try and fix it myself. Mm. I bring an expert in to, to, to help. So that the, the outside help can be counselor, can be pastor, can be friends. But the way that we break negative cycles of thinking is to, one, become aware of what it is, mm. expose it to the truth, mm. and then keep exposing it to the truth. And Act in the way that you know is true. Okay. You know, I hesitate to use the phrase fake it until you make it, mm. but the idea is, uh, you know, Ellen White says something similar in Steps to Christ where she says, uh, don't wait to feel your faith, act as if you believe. True. So the way that we behave can influence our thinking just as much as our thinking and our emotions can influence the way we behave. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably a le question leading on to that. Um, I find myself lying when backed up against the wall, and I hate it. I love the Lord and my loved ones, but I feel powerless when this happens. How can I stop? Mm. Again, that might require some, some exploration mm. as to why the need to lie. Mm. Because there are various reasons why people lie. Some lie because they're pathological. Mm -hmm. Some people lie because they're fearful about the consequences of telling the truth. Um, there are multiple reasons why people may lie. We need to get to the bottom of it. Because the, 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 the lying is a symptom of something else going on, an yeah. underlying issue. Yeah. So we need to get to the root of that, and that might require some, some outside uh, intervention to be able to do that. Oh, good. Also, it's about being honest with ourselves and being courageous mm. because oftentimes what we anticipate will be the negative result of telling the truth mm. is a lot worse in the anticipation than it is in the reality. True. Uh, when we live in a lie, we, we are in bondage because as, as long as we keep living contrary to the values that we hold, we will experience um, emotional um, disturbance. Mm. So the truth will set us free, but somebody said it will make you miserable first. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to send another question, but I don't know if anyone from the congregation has a question before I bring the next one. If you don't, no problem. If you do, um, there's an opportunity now. I'll, ask, I'll ask this question. Uh, my children in school for most of the day and their minds are being molded. How can I, as a parent, help in that molding of their minds with so little time? Use the time that you have in the best way that you can. Mm. Um, give them a solid foundation. Um, make sure that when they are in your presence, you are exhibiting the values and the character that you want them to, um, to exhibit. Uh, but we do have a limited time to, to influence our children. We cannot shield them from the influences that are outside, um, but we can give them a solid platform so that when they encounter uh, values that don't accord with what we believe, that they have the capacity to make good choices. Mm. So, you know, it's like we're not necessarily telling them that you cannot do such and such. We're trying to teach them that when you get in that situation, you make this choice because. Yes. So we're helping them to, to be discerning. Mm. If we just, if it's just about do's and don'ts, when they're not in our presence, they will do whatever they want. But yes. if they can internalize good values, then it's like when you're driving and you see the speed camera. Um, if you have internalized good values, then you will drive consistently when the speed camera is not there. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. 
Um, if that is it, I haven't got any other questions that came through. Um, I didn't see any on social media either. I've got a question, please. So come, come to the front with a question. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for the message. I used to hear that from the Catholic believer. Give me a child, and when he's seven years old, he or she will ever remain a Catholic. Yeah, Jesuit son. And tonight you said that when a child gets to the age of 14, that child is likely going to remain in that frame of mind, a kind of paradigm. You also quoted the scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. Train the child in the way it should go, and when it's old, he will not depart from it. My question is, where is the room for repentance. And secondly, could your reframing and reframing work in this situation? Thank you. All right, sir. Absolutely. Um, what Barna's research is indicating is a general trend. It does not preclude the functioning of the Holy Spirit in our lives because it, it is the Holy Spirit who gives us the capacity to, to think in different ways. Conversion um, is an experience that we go through on a daily basis. So it's not something we can do in our own strength. The, the reframing and the preframing are the, the tools that God gives us to be able to change the way we think and the way that we operate. So... We shouldn't be discouraged by what the research is, is indicating. It's simply highlighting to us that we have this window of opportunity uh, in which to maximize the capacity to expose our young people to good values. It doesn't mean that after that period they cannot experience conversion. It just means that this is the general trend and that we need to uh, make use of, of the time that we have. You know, some people say, you know, well, I'm not going to force my children to, to make decisions about... When they're older, then they can make... Oh, nah, they're already making decisions. True. You know, we, don't, we do not operate in a vacuum. True. So our role as parents and as grandparents, as spiritual mentors, is to create a platform, create an environment in which they can make good decisions. So, yeah, thank you for your question. No. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's anybody else before we close off. Um, but I like that, that there is hope, even though you may be older than 14, you may pass the age of seven, that doesn't mean it's a full stop. That's the beauty of Christianity, where Christ can step in and change that situation. So, no, thank you very much for that question and for the answer. If you can please give us a snippet of what you're going to speak about tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, forgot for a moment. Um, <laughs> tomorrow morning, <laughs> tomorrow morning, we're going to be looking at the topic of boundaries and the important roles, the role that good, healthy boundaries play in the way that we experience ourselves and in the way that we experience relationships and even in the way that we experience um, God. So tomorrow morning, we're looking at uh, healthy boundaries. And then in the evening, we're looking at emotionally healthy parenting. So how do we raise emotionally intelligent children? Well, we become emotionally intelligent parents. So we'll be looking at that tomorrow evening. We're kind of bouncing off what Karen looked at last week. Oh, fantastic. So that's 11.15 tomorrow for the service. It'll be great to have you there to talk and understand about boundaries and then 6 o'clock in the evening. Um, Pastor, can you pray to close for us? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Shall we stand as we pray? 
Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, a time in which we can experience your presence. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will help us to focus our minds on you, focus your mind, our minds on your word, and transform us with the power of your word, we pray. Uh, we ask that you will help us to have a good night's rest mm -hmm. so that we can come together fresh, that we might receive that which you have to give. So bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out and hope to see you tomorrow. And by the way, just because of the October family focus is over, um, we're still going to be having Vespers at 7.30. Some will be live streamed, others won't. If you're around in the area, it would be great to have you 7.30 every Friday. We'll have interaction. And some of these topics that were discussed in this month, we're going to pick up on because they're really just introductions. We want to get a little bit more deeper as we interact with one another. So I pray you have a good night's rest and see you tomorrow. God bless.